just wanted to say hi to my friends and family, my parents, Bill and Paula Fallon in Red Lion, Pennsylvania. Good morning. This is the Morning News on WSBA, hour number three. It's a Wednesday morning. I'm Gary Sutton. And I'm Chris Tyler. WSBA News time is 810. Well, a lot of you have followed with us over the past number of years. And really, I think it started in 2005 with the midnight pay raise, the corruption in the state of Pennsylvania. And with us this morning, a guy who is, I think, one of the best columnists in the state of Pennsylvania. He's with the Pittsburgh Tribune and author of Keystone Corruption, a Pennsylvania insider's view of a state gone wrong. It's a book out, started out in September 9th. And I'll tell you what, this is a must read if you're interested in what is going on around you in the state of Pennsylvania. And we're talking about its author this morning. I got the book yesterday, and I, you know, the only thing that's maybe put it down is I have to do the show today, frankly. Unbelievable read. And I, I'm telling you, for people out there, this, this is the must read. And in fact, you're going to be in town. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, in a moment. But, you know, you've had a chance to look at this over the years, uh, the kind of corruption we have here in the state of Pennsylvania. 38 different officials, mostly uh, representatives and aides and so forth, uh, since 2007 to 2012 have uh, been put in prison. Talk a little bit about that. Well, yeah, it's just been incredible. Uh, not, not only uh, uh, here in Harrisburg, but uh, uh, an ex-Supreme uh, Court justice uh, in Pittsburgh uh, uh, was, was uh, convicted of a felony. She's actually doing house arrest, not prison. Right. And in northeastern Pennsylvania, it just had a wave of corruption involving uh, local officials and the Kids for Cash scandal. Right. So, yeah, it's been all over. But what I saw firsthand here was the uh, corruption at the state capitol, uh, where we had an unprecedented situation by midsummer of eight ex-legislative leaders being in prison all at the same time. Uh, that's down to seven now since uh, Vince Fumo, a uh, senator from Philadelphia, got out right. uh, in August. But um, nowhere else in the country have we seen anything like that. You know, you look at this whole business right now, and I, you know, one of the things you allude to in the book, and in fact, it's kind of a warning, I think, at some point in time here, you say, uh, there's no simple solution to stopping corruption of this magnitude. The crimes against the taxpayers will continue as long as people turn their heads to abuse, legal graft, and thievery. It seemed like in 2005 with the midnight pay raise, and I know on our show, people woke up all of a sudden, and I mean, there was a clamor like I haven't ever seen before in my years of doing this uh, that really struck out there, and I think set the tone for what was to come in 2007 to 2012. Am I wrong on that? No, you're absolutely right on that. Uh, the only problem is it was short-lived. I, yes. I've never seen the intensity of the pay raise reaction either. Nothing like it over the years. It was it's incredible. Uh, and it lasted for a while, and there's a core group of reformers remains from all of that. Uh, but by and large, those kind of things tend to pass, and people forget about it or, you know, put it in the past. And uh, and in some part, you know, a lot of those legislators who voted for it were voted out of office. There right. was a huge turnover uh, in the following election. You know, we used to hear about uh, Chicago and Illinois being a very corrupt city and, and a corrupt state. Has Pennsylvania turned into one of the most corrupt states in the nation? That's a question I'm asked all the time in terms of, you know, uh, talking about this book. And uh, I don't think it's just turned into it. I think it has been one of the most corrupt states in the nation. I don't think it is the most corrupt state. You know, if you look at Illinois, which has had four governors go to prison, right. yeah. no, no one really tops that. Yeah. And New York State historically has had problems with bribery in the legislature. There's a, a scam underway now and, and with, with senators involved and going to prison. And, and uh, uh, Louisiana and New Jersey has historically have had a lot of problems. But right now, you know, Pennsylvania would be in the, clearly be in the top five. There's no question about it. However, in your book, if people read it carefully, you go back, uh, Speaker of the House has not exactly been a position you wanted to leave uh, later on because you knew you were probably heading to prison. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and the irony of that is there are uh, three taxpayer-paid portraits of uh, uh, speakers of the House who, who uh, were convicted of felonies still hanging in the main hallways of, of the, the House when, when, when you put, come into the Capitol Rotunda and take a right walk down the hallway. All these portraits of speakers, and you've got uh, Bill DeWeese there, you've got John Purzell there, and you've got uh, uh, a speaker from the, the 1970s that uh, you know uh, also uh, was convicted of a felony. So, you know, it, it's uh, on the other side, you got Bob Mella, President Pro Tem right. uh, of the Senate, a taxpayer-paid portrait who is still in prison. And nobody thought to take those things down? There's been no discussion about that? 
No, nah, there really hasn't been. You know, I guess it's uh, uh, you know not something that's uh, uh, they really want to talk about because hey, you'd have to start tearing the capital apart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you you take us back to that too in the book. I mean, you go back and say, you know, this isn't just something that came recently. And you, you talk about you know going into the capital and actually having it uh, dedicated by Theodore Roosevelt here in the state of Har- in, in the uh, town of Harrisburg. Tell us a little bit about some of the the you know back in the past kind of corruption that went on a bit. Well, you know, probably one of the worst scandals the state ever saw was in the early 1900s. It was called the Capital Graft Scandal. And it was, it was, the, there were these huge overcharges for the furnishings of a new capital that was built uh, after an old capital burned down. So you had this new capital and, uh, you know, the, the, all of the, the furniture, the, the, uh, the wallpaper, everything is like charged seven, ten times as much as it was worth. Uh, more than a dozen people were indicted for that. Several went to prison. Of course, none of the top political bosses were touched by it, who undoubtedly knew what was going on with it. And uh, uh, it's, it's ironic that, that I think that, that the uh, um, state capital is a monument to graft. And, and, you know, the very building that these people work in today uh, was built uh, and, and centered on this corruption. So, you know, it's, it's been going on uh, a lot longer than we've been alive, Gary. You know, when you look at the names in here, John Purcell, Vince Fumo, Mike Vion, Bill DeWeese, and they're just a few of the names in there of, of the people who have gone to prison. The, the one thing, as I was reading your book last night, that really kind of came together was arrogance, that there was an arrogance among these four people that and others uh, that really kind of just was maybe the tying link. And that was certainly one of the things. Um, uh, there's no question they were very arrogant, and that uh, that came through in the pay raise, and it came through in their later actions. But I think another theme that occurred among those people and the others is is a lust for power. Yes, and and that uh, retaining the majority or regaining the majority is what drove all this effort to use taxpayer funded staff and taxpayer resources for campaigns so that they could stay in control. John Prezel said it when he was on the witness stand. If you're not in the majority, you have nothing. And and that's, you know, you don't call the shots. If you're, you're in the majority and you're the speaker, you decide what they vote on. You decide, you know, which bills come up. You get the nicest offices. You're in the minority. You don't get that. So, uh, yeah, that is all part of the all part of the problem. Brad Bum said, columnist, Pittsburgh Tribune, and author of Keystone Corruption, a Pennsylvania insider's view of a state going wrong. He'll be at a book signing on Saturday here in New York. And Brad, where are you going to be on Saturday for people to get out there? Well, it's Ir- Irvin's books uh, across from Delco. It's actually right across from the Giant on, I believe it's called White Road. Yeah, White White Street. Yep. White Street. Yes. So you'll be there on Saturday. And what time will you be there? That's from 12 to 2 at Irvin's Books. And that's a great chance for you to get over to Irvin's Books and see Brad and, and get one of these books. I'm telling you, it's a, it's a paperback. It's a good read. And uh, you want to find out a history of corruption in Pennsylvania over the past several years, you'll get it in this book. It is well-researched. And, uh, Brad, hats off to you on writing something I think all of us kind of can get our arms around because there was so much happening during those years that you kind of almost lost track. That's great, and I think it's one reason the book has done well, is that everybody knows one or two of these stories or some piece of this, and it was an effort to pull all this together. And it's like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, now, now it makes some sense in terms of the chronology and the history uh, involving these people, especially the recent spate of uh, felony convictions. You start the book with John Prezell in an elevator. So let's go to John Prezell first. You had kind of mixed thoughts on him as you start out. Yeah, I mean, this is a... a I was a hard-working guy from a working-class family in Philadelphia, former maitre d', who uh, worked hard for everything he ever got, worked his way up, won a legislative seat, got up, uh, was majority leader, then became uh, uh, speaker. And somewhere between becoming majority leader and speaker, after former speaker Matt Ryan died, uh, uh, Prevell started to go off the wrong track. He started to think about running for governor, and that's when he started you know, looking at grabbing every dollar he could for campaigns. Vince Fumo. Vince Fumo is probably the brightest and the most powerful uh, legislator I've ever seen at the Capitol. He was even powerful as a member of the minority, uh, but he was also called one of the most crooked politicians in the country uh, by Reader's Digest. I used to see people say Mike Vion's suits cost more than most people had in uh, Beaver <laughs> County. Mike Vion. Yeah, Mike uh, was, was a um, from a working class family in Beaver County where they don't wear the kind of 
you know, pinstripe suits that he always wore. Uh, but uh, Mike um, uh, started out, uh, as a lot of these guys do, you know, trying to change things. And, you know, I mean, he was very liberal and labor-oriented, but nonetheless, he started off on the right track and, like all of them, got caught up in the power uh, over the years. Uh, and uh, a little anecdote about Mike is that, you know, long before he was convicted or even under investigation, I did a story about his expenses, wanted to track him down, look him in the eye, ask him about it, and he said, is that the best you can do? Well, it wow. was. Uh, you know, and and we did later dig up his his uh, uh, corrupt uh, nonprofit in Beaver County called the Beaver Initiative for Growth, and there's a chapter in the book about that. And also known as Big, and also the money didn't find its way there too well during that particular time. Yeah, uh, ten million dollars worth of state tax money Jeez. went and funded this uh, uh, nonprofit that he abused. Ten million dollars. Can you imagine that? I mean, that, that's uh, especially to an area that really could have used that money to, to help with some of the growth in, in that particular area. You know, one of the things I remember about Vion was in 2005 with the pay raise. And he was one of the guys that stood up and said, hey, I'm taking it. I don't yeah. care. Yeah. I mean, he stood out as loudly as anybody during that time. Well, he was the only legislator who voted against the repeal. The yep. only one. And that marked him. If he hadn't done that, he might still be there. Uh, because they did like him in his district, but that in particular, just you know, just even people in Beaver County just turned off. He, he, the, the pay raise was so uh, volatile, so toxic that you cannot uh, vote against the repeal. But he did. And I know a lot of my friends out there, like Eric Epstein and others, uh, went to war over this thing. And Eric even kept on, and you mentioned in the book, uh, kept on putting the numbers out there of people who hadn't paid the money back over the years. To, to this day, he's still doing it. He puts uh, semi-annual reports on uh, who hasn't paid back the so-called unvouchered expenses, you know, which you, you know was the uh, right. advance money that they took on the pay raise. They're not supposed to get a pay raise while they're in office uh, that they voted for, uh, but they found a way to do it, and uh, some of them kept it, refused to give it back, and uh, Eric is still hounding them over it, which I think is admirable, actually. I found out something in the book I did not know about, the final one here, Bill DeWeese. Became roommates with uh, was it was it uh, v- Vion in no, no, uh, Pris- it was Prisell of, of Prisell, that was it and they became roommates at Camp Hill Prison right right and both former speakers of the House uh, one a Republican one a Democrat put together in the same cell uh, for a certain period it wasn't very long I think it was a couple weeks unbelievable I, I'd love to have a tape of those conversations <laughs> yes you know. uh, Brad great book uh, again Saturday you're going to be at Irvin's uh, bookstore it's over there on White Street. And the book sign is from 12 to 2, right? That's correct, 12 um, to 2. And you can meet Brad Bumstead, and, and you'll sign books for him too, right? That's that's the purpose there, yes, sir. Yeah, and even if a couple of people come out there that, uh, well, no, I won't, I won't get into that. So, <laughs> Brad, really great having you aboard. Uh, proud of the work you did, man. It's really good stuff. And uh, Merry Christmas to you and a Happy New Year. Merry Christmas, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Brad. We look forward to talking again very soon. All right, thank you. Take Bye. care. Brad Bumstead with us here on the Morning News.